In the 17th century, St. Leonard of Port Maurice wrote a wonderful little book called The Hidden Treasure, The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. St. Leonard's purpose was to endeavor to have people appreciate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass so that it wouldn't, figuratively speaking, be a hidden treasure. Who could have ever imagined that the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass from being a hidden treasure, figuratively, has now become a hidden treasure literally. I'm Julius Smetona. This is What Catholics Believe. Today, we are privileged to continue with our series on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We will be watching and then offering commentary on a motion picture made in 1940 in Chicago, Illinois, in a cathedral, which was narrated by Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, perhaps the most famous Catholic television personality in history. Archbishop Sheen at that time was a Monsignor. With us today to discuss this tape and the hidden treasure are three priests who say the traditional Latin Mass, the hidden treasure, exclusively. Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Father Clarence Kelly, spiritual director of St. Joseph's Novitiate, a congregation of traditional Catholic sisters in Round Top, New York. And Father Thomas Marachka, pastor of St. Anne Church in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Father Kelly, what do you have to say then about <clears throat> the hidden treasure? Well, a lot of people who are watching this program are Catholics. And uh, no doubt also there are many Protestant people, perhaps uh, some fundamentalist Christians watching the program as well, who are interested in some of the things we have to say because they find that on a number of issues uh, we have the same views. Uh, and perhaps they are under the impression that the, the area which separates us is not so great as some might imagine. And many of them also think that the Protestant Reformation was the result of a protest against abuses in the Catholic Church, and that certain men like Martin Luther, seeing these abuses in the church, decided to take a stand against them. That is what they have been taught in the history books, but that is not true. Uh, in fact, the reason there was a Protestant Reformation was not because there were abuses in the church, but because of the holy sacrifice of the mass. If there is one thing that the conflict could be reduced to, it is the holy sacrifice of the mass. And the holy sacrifice of the mass has very broad implications. There are many, many things which uh, lead up to it and flow from it. Most notably, we believe, uh, and the church has always believed, and Christians have believed from the time of Christ up until the Protestant Reformation, that there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ, and that there is only one way that sin can be atoned for, and that is through the shedding of the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But when our Lord shed his precious blood upon the cross, he devised a means by which we would have access to that precious blood. And the means by which we have access to that precious blood is through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. For the holy sacrifice of the Mass essentially does three things. It first makes present today the sacrifice that took place upon Calvary. This morning, I offered the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, as I do every day. And at the moment of consecration, when I said the words over the bread, and then said those words over the wine, the same words that our Lord used at the Last Supper, the bread was changed into his body, and the wine was changed into his precious blood. And the exact sentiments that welled up in the heart of Christ as he hung upon the cross, were made present on the altar. Those sentiments which are in his sacred heart as he stands before the throne of his father are brought down upon that altar. So the, the sacrifice that he offered on the cross is renewed on the altar in an unbloody fashion. But not only is it renewed, it is memorialized. Our Lord said, do this in memory of me. And finally, the third thing is that the fruits of his sacrifice, the fruits 
of the shedding of his precious blood, the merit that he earned on that cross when he offered up his life for our salvation. Those merits are made present to us. And this is how the, the, the salvation comes to us. This is what gives power, for example, to the sacraments. The sacrament of baptism is able to wash away original sin and uh, causes the infusion of the life of God into the soul because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. When someone kneels before the priest in the confessional and confesses his sins, and the priest raises his hand and says, in the name of Christ, I absolve you of your sins, as our Lord instructed the apostles to do uh, after his resurrection, when he said to them, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. The, the source of the power of the sacraments is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And the means by which that power comes to us is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It was a rejection of the Mass, and therefore a rejection of making present Calvary upon the altar and memorializing the sacrifice of our Lord as our Lord determined it should be memorialized and having access to the merits of his precious blood. That is actually what was at the heart and soul of the Protestant Reformation. And that is what Luther rejected. And the reason he rejected it is because our Lord demands something of us. He gives to us this hidden treasure, and then he expects us to cooperate with him, to obey his commandments, to do his holy will, to do the will of his Father, to live in a state of sanctifying grace, and to overcome sin and to purge serious sin from our lives. And the reason we are able to do it, Luther thought, it was not possible. But the reason we are able to do it is because our Lord Jesus Christ gives us the power, the strength, and the means through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And that is why the Earth has a greater chance of survival without the Sun than it does without the Mass. So now let's turn to the hidden treasure, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, narrated in commentary by Archbishop Fulton Sheen. by giving bread, which is the very marrow of the earth, and by giving wine, which is its very blood. We are giving the two substances which have most traditionally nourished man, and thereby we are equivalently giving ourselves. and eternal God, this spotless host, which I, thy unworthy servant, offer unto thee, my living and true God, for mine own countless sins, offenses, and negligences, and for all here present. Offer unto thee, O Lord, the chalice of salvation. 
one time the members of the congregation brought gifts, such as bread and wine to be offered at the mass. Today, the offertory collection takes the place of the offer of these gifts of bread and wine. After handling the gifts of bread and wine, the celebrant washes his fingers. Today, this external cleansing is a symbol of the internal purity which priest and congregation should possess as they offer mass together. intones the preface, a solemn, beautiful song, calling upon the angels and archangels, thrones and dominations, and all the heavenly hosts, to sing a hymn of glory to the triune God, Sanctus, Sanctus. We have entered the most important part of the Mass, the canon. The ancient, unchanging sequence of prayers which contains the heart of the Mass, the consecration. Through the words and action of the canon, the celebrant accomplishes the great work of the Mass, bringing Christ himself down on our altar that we may offer him to God. Our gifts, bread and wine, representing ourselves, are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Then the celebrant offers Christ and ourselves in union with Christ to God. If you're watching what Catholics believe we're talking about. Father Marachka, perhaps you can explain to our viewers exactly what they're seeing. This does not look like the typical traditional Latin <clears throat> Mass one would see most often. Uh, yes, Julius. Uh, there are many Catholics who have never witnessed a solemn high mass, and what we have just viewed is the mass in all of its splendor and its glory, with the sacred ministers of the church being used at this particular mass. Uh, going back to when a, uh, a seminarian is going through the seminary, he is first a tonsured cleric, then he receives minor orders, porter, lector, exorcist, and acolyte. And then he proceeds to major orders, which begins with the subdiaconate. 
Then after that, he receives the diaconate, and becomes a deacon. And finally, holy orders, where he becomes a priest to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And in this particular film we watched, you will notice there were the three sacred ministers there upon the altar. There is the priest, the celebrant of the Mass, and to his right, you have the deacon of the Mass, and uh, to his left, the subdeacon of the Mass. Uh, the deacon of the Mass uh, pre prepares the men at the table for the sacrifice, prepares the chalice and everything. The subdeacon um, also assists the deacon in the perf per performance of these particular duties. And uh, most people will remember, if they, well, we never saw anything in our church, but it was uh, what you witnessed in your churches, uh, the faithful out there, uh, if you remember back in the 1950s and before, was probably a high mass where you had the priest alone sing the mass with incense or without incense and without the assistance of the sacred ministers. This again is a solemn high mass where you have the employment of these particular sacred uh, ministers in performance of the holy sacrifice of the mass, which is their function. Okay. <clears throat> Brother Kelly. Well, uh, it's very important for people to understand uh, that uh, the splendor that they do see there, they would not ordinarily see at a low mass, for example, but that all of the externals are meant to express in some way some profound truth or some uh, uh, spiritual reality. And uh, people just uh, looking at it, they might find it somewhat mystifying and obscure and difficult to comprehend. But every single ceremony that is performed there is performed uh, with a, a certain uh, purpose in mind and uh, expresses some great spiritual truth. I think uh, Father uh, Jenkins uh, is going to ex explain a little bit about uh, the part of the Mass up to the offertory, though. Yes, I'd be very happy to. Uh, it is true that uh, most people watching this film footage probably would not recognize what is going on here because they're accustomed to a low mass, or at least they remember from years ago a low mass where the priest himself stands at the altar and uh, faces the tabernacle with the real presence of Christ and faces the crucifix over the altar. And uh, he says some prayers out loud and he says other prayers quietly, uh, but in any case, he does not sing at the altar. Um, that is called a low mass, and I think that's what most people probably remember. The the mass with the deacon and the subdeacon, though, actually harkens back to the mass as it was in the earliest centuries. And uh, it really brings out the splendor of the mass. And it is supposed to represent also the throngs of angels who are adoring God at his throne in heaven. If you read the book of the Apocalypse, you read the scene uh, depicted that is carried out in heaven in eternity with uh, choirs of angels and myriads and myriads of angels adoring God at his throne. And the church, for, during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass in particular, is supposed to be a mirror image of that vision of eternity and the splendor of God. And as Father Kelly mentioned, every single movement of the priest is carefully prescribed by the rubrics so that no priest uh, is, um, is performing, is entertaining. In the new Mass, it seems that most priests have to you know, be concerned about how they're going to come across that, that table as they're dealing with the people and you know, whether their smile is correct and so on. But in the, in the traditional Mass, the priest's own personality was supposed to actually be, be uh, covered over by the, the universal character of the Mass. And he was supposed to be an altar Christus. He was supposed to stand there in the place of our Lord. It is his great privilege to utter the words of Christ at the altar which effect the, the transformation, the transubstantiation of the bread into the body of Christ and the wine into his blood. So his own personality is supposed to recede, and he is supposed to be there representing our Lord. The, uh, the offertory of the Mass is one of the three essential parts of the Mass, such that if a person in former days were to have missed it, he would have missed Mass. He would not have fulfilled his Sunday obligation. That's how important it is. And it's the preparation of the sacrifice. That's when the bread and the wine are brought to the altar and blessed. And that's where each one of them is held up beef to God and offered to him. And in the offertory of the traditional mass, it is made very clear that the elements that are brought to the altar uh, 
are brought there to be transformed into the body and blood of Christ in reparation for the sins of the world. If you were to compare that notion of the Catholic Church with the idea that is propagated by the new mass, you'd find that the, the traditional mass and the new mass are actually two different forms of worship. The offertory, so-called, of the new mass was actually taken wholesale from the Jewish grace before meals of a Seder. Uh, now, you may remember uh, reading recently in newspapers certain periods of the year when Christians, especially Catholics, are having Seder meals in their churches and, and so on. Uh, well, this is no accident because the offertory of the New Mass itself is actually a Jewish Seder. And if you read the text of that, it talks about the the uh, the bread that is brought to the altar and the wine that is brought to the altar as being the, the 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 work of human hands and how it will become our spiritual bread or our spiritual drink but the notion of the real presence of our lord in the blessed sacrament truly present body and blood soul and divinity in the host and in the chalice that is totally obliterated in the new mass the the essential idea of the offertory of the traditional mass is that we are offering sacrifice and in offering sacrifice we are not just there to offer our homage to God we are not just there to clap and sing we're not just there to listen to preaching uh, if there were no clapping and singing that wouldn't change the mass if there were no uh, well clapping of course we wouldn't have that anyway <laughs> but you could have the traditional mass with no singing whatsoever you could have the traditional mass with no preaching whatsoever but the people who would come there would worship God because the essence of the traditional mass is that it is not simply man who worships God but it is the second person of the Blessed Trinity the very son of God himself who adores his father through this tremendous sacrifice of obedience at Calvary. And it is by our union with that sacrifice of Jesus Christ that anything we do has any value whatsoever before God. In closing, I'd like to ask one question. Uh, we see from the commentary by Archbishop Sheen that these rubrics and ceremonies go back to the earliest times that in fact is a principle of the church never to drop into disuse a ceremony or a tradition. How does that make the argument look which says that the new mass where one can recognize none of this goes back to the early Christians and nothing essential has been changed? The new mass goes back to 1968 is what it does. The, the notion that the new mass is really the ancient mass is not true. It's a production conceived in the minds of those who took upon themselves what I personally would classify as the most revolutionary act in the history of the world next to the fall of man itself. And that is to determine that they would reform the Christian religion from within the church and from above in every conceivable way. And that's what they did. They reformed uh, the sacraments. They reformed Catholic truth. They reformed Catholic morality. And then, with the help of men who did not even believe in the holy sacrifice of the men, six Protestants, they then reformed the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass itself. The new Mass is a modern invention in order to serve as the worship of the new church. The claim that it goes back to the early years of the church is not true. You've been watching what Catholic...